Just Mercy, Chapter 8, All God's Children Uncried Tears Imagine teardrops left uncried from pain trapped inside, waiting to escape through the windows of your eyes. Why won't you let us out? The tears question the conscience. Relinquish your fears and doubts and heal yourself in the process. The conscience told the tears, I know you really want me to cry, but if I release you from bondage and gaining your freedom, you die. The tears gave it some thought before giving the conscience an answer. If crying brings you to triumph, then dying's not such a disaster. Ian E. Manuel, Union Correctional Institution. Trina Garnett was the youngest of 12 children living in the poorest section of Chester, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. Chester had an extraordinarily high rates of poverty, crime, and unemployment and the worst ranked public school system among Pennsylvania's 501 districts. Nearly 46% of the ch city's children were living below the federal poverty level. Trina's father, Walter Garnett, was a former boxer whose failed career had turned him into a violent, abusive alcoholic. Trina's mother, Edith Garnett, was sick leave after bearing so many children, some of whom were conceived during rapes by her husband. He would regularly punch, kick, and verbally abuse her in front of the children. When she lost consciousness during the beatings, he would shove a stick down her throat to revive her for more abuse. Nothing was safe in the Garnet home. Trina once watched her father strangle her pet dog into silence because it wouldn't stop barking. He would beat the animal to death with a hammer and threw its limp body out a window. Trina had twin sisters, Lynn and Linda, who were a year older than she. They taught her to play invisible when she was a small child to shield her from their father when he was drunk and prowling their apartment with his belt to beat them. Trina was taught to hide under the bed or in a closet and remain as quiet as possible. Trina showed signs of intellectual disabilities and other troubles at a young age. When she was a toddler, she became seriously ill after ingesting lighter fluid when she was left unattended. At the age of five, she accidentally set herself on fire, resulting in severe burns over her chest, stomach, and back. After weeks in the hospital, she was left terribly scarred. She was nine years old when her mother died. Soon after that, Trina's father began sexually abusing her older sisters, and they fled. His abuse turned to Trina, Lynn, and Linda. The girls ran away from home and began roaming the streets of Chester. Trina and her sisters would eat out of garbage cans. Sometimes they would not eat for days. They slept in parks and public bathrooms. The girls stayed with their older sister, Eddie, until Eddie's husband, Edie, until Edie's husband began sexually abusing them. Their older siblings and aunts would sometimes provide temporary shelter, but the living situation would get disrupted by violence or death. And so Trina would find herself wandering the streets again. Her mother's death, the abuse, and the desperate circumstances all worsened Trina's emotional and mental health problems. She was sometimes so ill, her sisters got a relative to take her to the hospital. But she was penniless and was never allowed to stay long enough to become stable or recover. Late at night in August 1976, 14-year-old Trina and her friend, 16-year-old Frances Newsom, climbed through the window of a house to talk to the boys who lived there. The mother of these boys had forbidden her children to play with Trina, but Trina wanted to see them. Once she climbed into the dark house, she lit matches to find her way to the boys' room. The house caught fire. It spread quickly, and the two boys who were sleeping in the house in the home died from smoke asphyxiation. Their mother accused Trina of starting the fire intentionally, but Trina and her friend insisted that it was an accident. Trina was traumatized by the boy's death and could barely speak when the police arrested her. She was so non-functional and listless that her appointed lawyer thought she was incompetent to stand trial. But he failed to file the appropriate motions to support an incompetency determination, which would have pushed the trial back until Trina was well enough to de defend herself. Her lawyer, who was later disbarred and jailed for criminal misconduct, also never challenged the state's decision to try Trina as an adult. As a result, Trina was forced to stand trial for second-degree murder in an adult courthouse. 
At trial, Francis Newsom testified against Trina in exchange for the charges against her being dropped. Trina was convicted of second-degree murder and the trial moved to the sentencing phase. Pennsylvania sentencing law was inflexible. The only sentence for those convicted of second-degree murder was mandatory life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Judge Reed, who presided over the case, expressed serious misgivings about the sentence he was forced to impose. Given Trina's devastating life circumstances and the fact that she hadn't intended to harm anyone, this is the saddest case I've ever seen, he wrote. For a tragic crime committed at 14, Trina was condemned to die in prison. At the age of 16, Trina walked through the gates of, a, of the State Correctional Institution at Muncie, an adult prison for women, terrified, still suffering from trauma and mental illness, and intensely vulnerable, with the knowledge that she would never leave. Prison spared Trina the uncertainty of homelessness, but presented new dangers and challenges. Not long after she arrived at Muncie, a male correctional officer pulled into her into a secluded area and raped her. The crime was discovered when Trina became pregnant. As is often the case, the correctional officer was fired but not criminally prosecuted. Trina remained imprisoned and gave birth to a son while handcuffed to a bed. It wasn't until 2008 that most states abandoned the practice of shackling or handcuffing incarcerated women during delivery. Trina's baby boy was taken away from her and placed in foster care. She was devastated, and her mental health deteriorated further. Over the years, she became less functional and more mentally disabled. Her body began to spasm and quiver uncontrollably until she required a cane and then a wheelchair. By the time she turned 30, prison doctors diagnosed her with multiple sclerosis, intellectual disability, and mental illness related to trauma. In 2014, Trina turned 52. She has been in prison for 38 years. She is one of nearly 500 people in Pennsylvania who have been condemned to mandatory life imprisonment without parole for crimes they were accused of committing when they were between the ages of 13 and 17. It is the largest population of child offenders condemned to die in prison in any single jurisdiction in the world. In 1990, Ian Manuel and two other two older boys attempted to rob a couple who were out for dinner in Tampa, Florida. Ian was 13 years old when Debbie Baker resisted. Ian shot her with the handgun given to him by the older boys. The bullet went through Baker's cheek, shattering several teeth and severely damaging her jaw. All three boys were arrested and charged with armed robbery and attempted homicide. Ian's appointed lawyer encouraged him to plead guilty assuring him that he would be sentenced to no more than 15 years in prison. The lawyer didn't realize that two of the charges against Ian were punishable with life sentences of life with sentences of life imprisonment without parole. The judge accepted Ian's plea and then sentenced him to life with no parole. Even though he was 13, the judge condemned Ian for living in the streets, for not having good parental supervision, and for his prior arrests for shoplifting and minor property crimes. Ian was sent to an adult prison, the Appalachie Correctional Institution, one of the toughest prisons in Florida. Juveniles housed in adult prisons are five times more likely to be the victims of sexual assault. So the staff at Appalachie put Ian, who was small for his age, in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement at Appalachie means living in a co concrete box the size of a walk-in closet. You get your meals through a slot, you do not see other inmates, and you never touch or get near another human being. If you act out by talking back or refusing to follow an order, you are forced to sleep on the concrete floor without a mattress. If you shout or scream, your time in solitary is extended. If you hurt yourself by refusing to eat or mutilating your body, your time in solitary is extended. If you complain to officers or anything, say anything menacing or inappropriate, your time in solitary is extended. You get three showers a week and are allowed 45 minutes in a small caged area for exercise a few times a week. Otherwise, you are alone, hidden away in your concrete box, week after week, month after month. In solitary, Ian became a self-described cutter. He would take anything sharp on his food tray to hurt himself. His mental health unraveled, and he attempted suicide several times. 
Each time he hurt himself or acted out, his time in, in isolation was extended. Ian spent 18 years in uninterrupted solitary confinement. Once a month, Ian was allowed to make a phone call. Soon after he arrived in prison on Christmas Eve in 1992, he used his call to reach out to Debbie Baker, the woman he shot. When she answered the phone, Ian spelled out an emotional apology, expressing his deep regret and remorse. Miss Baker was stunned to hear from the boy who had shot her, but she was moved by his call. She had physically recovered from the shooting and was working to become a successful bodybuilder and had started a magazine focused on women's health. That first surprising phone call led to a regular correspondence. Ian had been neglected by his family before the crime took place. He'd been left to wander the streets with little parental or family support. In solitary, he met few prisoners or staff. As he sank deeper into despair, Debbie Baker became one of the few people in Ian's life who encouraged him to remain strong. After communicating with Ian for several years, Baker wrote the court and told the judge who sentenced Ian that his sentence was too harsh and that his conditions of confinement were, were inhumane. She tried to talk to prison officials and gave interviews to the press to draw attention to Ian's plight. No one knows more than I do how destructive and reckless Ian's crime was, but what we're currently doing to him is mean and irresponsible she told one reporter. When this crime was committed, he was a child, a 13-year-old boy with a lot of problems, no supervision, and no help available. We are not children. The courts ignored Debbie Baker's call for a reduced sentence. By 2010, Florida had sentenced more than 100 children to life imprisonment without parole for non-homicide offenses. All of the youngest condemned children, 13 or 14 years of age, were black or Latino. Florida had the largest population in the world of children condemned to die in prison for non-homicides. The section of South Central Los Angeles where Antonio Nunez lived was plagued by gang violence. Antonio's mother would force her children to the floor when shooting erupted outside their crowded home. Numerous neighborhoods had been killed after being caught in the crossfire of gun violence. Antonio's home life was turbulent as well. From the time Antonio was in diapers, he endured beatings by his father, who hit him with his hand, fist, belt, and extension cords, causing bruises and cuts. He also witnessed terrifying conflicts in which his parents would violently assault and threaten to kill each other. Once, he even called the police. He began experiencing severe nightmares from which he woke screaming. Antonio's depressed mother neglected him. When he cried, she just left him alone. The only activity she could recall after ever attending for Antonio was his graduation from Drug Abuse Resistance Education, DARE, program in elementary school. In September 1999, a month after he turned 13, Antonio Nunez was riding his bicycle near his home when a stranger shot him in his stomach's side and arm. Antonio collapsed onto the street. His 14-year-old brother, Jose, heard him screaming and ran to his aid. Jose was shot in the head and killed. Antonio suffered serious internal injuries that hospitalized him for weeks. His mother sent him to live with relatives in Las Vegas, where he tried to recover from the tragedy of his brother's death. Antonio was relieved to put the gangs and violence of South Central Los Angeles behind him. He was helpful at home and spent evenings doing his homework with help from his co cousin's husband. But within a year, California probation authorities ordered him to return to Los Angeles. He was on probation for a mi prior minor offense. In poor urban neighborhoods across the United States, black and brown boys are routinely targeted by the police. Even though many of these kids have done nothing wrong, they are stopped, presumed guilty, and suspected of being dangerous or engaged in criminal activity. The random stops, questioning, and harassment dra dramatically increase the risk of arrest for petty crimes. Many of these children develop criminal records for behavior that wealthier children engage in without consequences. Forced back to South Central, Antonio struggled. A court later found that, living just blocks from where he was shot and his brother was killed, Nunez, offered traumas. Nunez suffered tra trauma symptoms including flashbacks and an intensified need to protect himself from real or perceived threats. 
He got his hands on a gun for self-defense, but was quickly arrested for it and placed in a juvenile camp. His supervisors reported that he responded positively to the structured environment and guidance of staff members. After returning from the camp, 14-year-old Antonio was invited to a party where two men twice his age let him in on a strange plan. They were planning to fake a kidnapping to get money from a relative who would pay the ransom. They insisted that Antonio join them. The pretend victim sat in the back seat, while the man named Juan Perez drove and Antonio sat in the passenger seat. Before they arrived at their destination to retrieve the money, they found themselves being followed and then chased by two Latino men in a gray van. At some point, Perez and the other man gave Antonio a gun and told him to shoot at the van and a dangerous high-speed shootout unfolded. The men chasing them were undercover police officers, but Antonio didn't know that when he fired. When a marked police car joined the pursuit, Antonio dropped the gun just before the car crashed into some trees. No one was injured, but Antonio and Perez were charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder of the police officers. Antonio and his 27-year-old co-defendant were to get, tried together in a joint trial, both were found guilty. The Orange County judge sentenced Antonio to imprisonment until his death, asserting that he was a dangerous gang member who could never change or be rehabilitated. Despite his difficult background and the absence of any significant tr- criminal history, the judge sent him to California's dangerous, overcrowded adult prisons. At 14, Antonio became the youngest person in the United States condemned to die in prison for a crime in which no one was physically injured. Most adults convicted of the kinds of crimes with which Trina, Ian, and Antonio were charged are not sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. So why were these teenagers? Juvenile justice systems vary across the United States, but most states would have kept Trina, Ian, or Antonio in a juvenile custody until they turned 18 or 21. At most, they might have stayed in custody until age 25 or older if their institutional history or juvenile detention record suggested that they were still a threat to public safety. In an earlier era, if you were 13 or 14 when you committed a crime, you would find yourself in the adult system with a lengthy sentence only if the crime were unusually high profile or committed by a black child against a white person in the South. For instance, in the famous Scottsboro Boys case in the 1930s, two of the defendants, Roy Wright and Eugene Williams, were just 13 years old when they were wrongfully convicted of rape and sentenced to death in Alabama. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, the politics of fear and anger sweeping the country and fueling mass incarceration was turning its attention to children. Influential criminologists predicted a new generation of super predators, sometimes expressly focusing on black and brown children. Theorists suggested that America would soon be overcome by elementary school youngsters who pack guns instead of lunches and who have absolutely no respect for human life. Across the country, nearly every state created laws to allow children to be prosecuted as adults, thinking that the juvenile justice system wouldn't be harsh enough. Many states lowered or eliminated the minimum age for trying children as adults, leaving children as young as eight vulnerable to adult prosecution and imprisonment. Tens of thousands of kids who who had previously been managed by the juvenile justice system with its well-developed protections and requirements for children, were now thrown into an increasingly overcrowded, violent, and desperate adult prison system. The predictions of super predators proved wildly inaccurate. The juvenile population in America increased from 1994 to 2000, but the juvenile crime rate, crime rate declined, leading even the academics who had originally supported the super predator theory to disclaim it. Of course, this admission came too late for kids like Trina, Ian, and Antonio. When I agreed to represent Trina, Ian, and Antonio years later, they had each been broken by years of hopelessness. Hidden away in adult prisons, they felt unknown and forgotten. With little family support or outside help, they each struggled to 
to survive in dangerous, terrifying environments. They were th there were thousands of children like them scattered throughout prisons in the United States, children who had been sentenced to life imprisonment without parole or other extreme sentences. Soon it became immediately clear that their extreme, unjust sentences were just one of the problems that had to be overturned. They were all damaged and traumatized by our system of justice. Trina's mental and physical health made life in prison extremely challenging. She was grateful for our help and showed remarkable improvement when we told her that we were going to fight to get her sentence reduced. But she had many other needs. She talked constantly about wanting to see her son. She wanted to know that she was not alone in the world. We tracked down her sisters and arranged a visit where Trina could see her son, and it seemed to strengthen her in ways I wouldn't have thought possible. I flew to California to meet Antonio at a maximum security prison dominated by aggressive guards, gangs, and frequent violence. It was an environment that corrupted healthy human development in every way. Reading had always been challenging for Antonio, but he was so determined to learn that he would read a passage over and over, looking up unfamiliar words in the dictionary we sent him. We sent him Darwin's The Origin of Species, which he hoped would help him better understand those around him. It turns out that Ian was very, very bright. Although being smart and sensitive made it his extended time in solitary confinement especially destructive, he had managed to educate himself, read hundreds of books, and write poetry and short stories that reflected an impressive intellect. He sent me dozens of thoughtful letters and poems. We decided to publish a report to draw attention to the plight of children in the United States who had been sentenced to die in prison. I wanted to photograph some of our clients in order to give the life without parole sentences imposed on children a human face. Florida was one of the few states that would allow pho photographers inside a prison, so we asked prison officials if Ian could be permitted out of his solitary no touch existence for an hour so that the photographer would, we hired could take the pictures. To my delight, they agreed. As soon as the visit with the photographer was over, immediate, Ian immediately wrote me a letter. Dear Mr. Stevenson, I hope this letter reaches you in good health and everything is going well for you. The focal point of this letter is to thank you for the photo session with the photographer and obtain information from how from you how I can obtain a good amount of photos. As you know, I've been in solitary confinement approximately 14.5 years. It's like the system has buried me alive and I'm dead to the outside world. Those photos mean so very much to me right now. All I have is $1.75 in my inmate account right now. If I send you $1 of that, how many photos will that purchase me? In my elation at that photo shoot today, I forgot to mention that today, June 19th, was my deceased mom's birthday. I know it's not a big significance, but reflecting on it afterward, it seemed symbolic and special that the photo shoot took place on my mother's birthday. I don't know how to make you feel the emotion and importance of those photos, but to be real, I want to show the world I'm alive. I want to look at those photos and feel alive. It would really help with my pain. I felt joyful today during the photo shoot. I wanted it to never end. Every time you all visit and leave, I feel saddened. But I capture and cherish those moments in time, replaying them in my mind's eye, feeling grateful for human interaction and contact. But today, just the simple handshake we shared was a welcome addition to my sensory deprived life. Please tell me how many photos I can get. I want those photos for myself almost as bad as I want my freedom. Thank you for making a lot of the positive occurrences that are happening in my life possible. I don't know exactly how the law led you to me, but I thank God it did. I appreciate everything you and EJI are doing for me. Please send me some photos, okay? And that is the end of chapter 8.